just want to let you know this is a real thing. Hello, folks. Hello. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Eastern State and to this month's truly exciting Searchlight series. My name is Sam Hunter, and I work in the education department here. So quick question. Who's been to Eastern State before? All right. Well, welcome back. That's a large portion of you guys. Um, but for um, those of you who are visiting for the first time, you've picked a truly excellent night to be here. So since there are some new faces in the crowd tonight, I'd like to give a brief overview of Eastern State and our programs before I welcome officially our guests. So right now we are in Eastern State Central Surveillance Hub. The cell blocks are the spokes that radiate out from this center point. The prison's design uh, called a radial plan, looks a little bit like a wagon wheel. You can kind of see that here. Now this design was so influential, it was copied over 300 times all across the world. So there's a prison, a hospital, or a school that looks like Eastern State literally everywhere. And you can see some examples here, even in a video game. <laughs> Um, so Eastern State really represents the first true attempt of prison reform and this constant continuous search for justice. Opening in 1829, Eastern State's primary purpose was this idea of re rehabilitation. And the founders believed that rehabilitation was achieved through solitary confinement, through penitence and hard labor. This was controversial then and it still remains so now. The purpose of prison and how solitary confinement fits into that are topics hotly debated within the criminal, ju uh, criminal justice conversation uh, today. Um, solitary confinement evolves a lot at Eastern State and eventually resembles how prisons use it today, so essentially for punishment purposes. Early 20th century at Eastern State, prisoners were actually allowed to be outside of their cells working, taking meals together, worshiping, and recreational activities. You can see the Eastern State basketball team here. So Eastern State would eventually incarcerate over 80,000 men, women, and children before closing for good in 1971. That's 142 years worth of history. It's an awful lot. History, though, that we work hard to interpret accurately and honestly ever since the museum opened up in 1994. Now, there are a couple ways that you can visit Eastern State First is by a self-guided audio tour narrated by actor Steve Buscemi, as well as former Eastern State prisoners and, uh, and staff. But also we have guided tours and programming that is available and open to all folks. But what I'm particularly interested in is in what we do with students. So we give tours to students of all ages. And as a matter of fact, we actually offer free tours for the school district of Philadelphia, as well as transportation reimbursements. Now we work hard to engage all of our visitors in um, critical thought around Eastern State, the motives of the founders, their philosophies, and as well as considering, you know, what should the purpose of prison be and what does a just prison system look like? This connection between the past and present is intentional and exists in all of our programming. Some tools that we use are two exhibits, um, the big graph and prisons today where visitors confront how prisons have changed since Eastern State. Um, these exhibits were built to spark dialogue and we actually use them to ask visitors, well, why do you think this information is important? Why are we talking about it? And what changes would you like to see happen to the prison system in the future? Continuing in this spirit, Eastern State's next big project is Hidden Lives Illuminated. You're gonna hear a lot more about that tonight, so stay tuned. And outside of that is our brand new visitor center, um, which is going to involve some really major awesome updates for um, visitor amenities and the overall visitor experience. I'm really excited about that. So if you'd like to learn more about how you can help support our mission, our projects, and everything, all that good stuff, there are folks here from our membership team that you are more than welcome to chat with at the reception after the talk today. Member support helps us keep events like Searchlight and tours for the School District of Philadelphia free, so thank you very much for that. Um, also, you were given by our team surveys. Please complete those. Um, we read them and your feedback really impacts the way that we host programs in the future. And next month's 
Searchlight is called the Mothers and Their Defenders uh, Together Supporting Justice. So um, Dr. Dorothy Johnson Spate and Chief Defender Keir Bradford Gray will discuss their innovative partnership with bringing participatory defense to Philadelphia, which sounds really exciting. But of course, what we're all waiting for is tonight's searchlight. So our guests tonight have been working for the past nine to 10 months on planning, organizing, and teaching animation and storytelling inside of two local prisons. Um, so here to talk more about their experiences are Sean Kelly, Senior Vice President and Project Lead of Hidden Lies Illuminated, William Wallace III, Teaching Artist for the Project, and Mandy Quinn, Superintendent Assistant at SCI Chester. So without further ado, here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm going to take one moment here to switch out PowerPoints. For those of you watching in Facebook land, it is hot at Eastern State Penitentiary tonight. Um, I always try to remember in moments like this that for 142 summers in a row, people lived in this building with no air conditioning. Uh, but it's hot in here. So if we seem a little casually dressed out there in Facebook land, that's because it's so hot in here. It's warm. Uh, Thank you for being here. I'm Sean Kelly from Eastern State. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the origins of the Hidden Lives Illuminated project. Um, and then we're going to, I'll pass it on to some of our partners and some of, of the members of the program. And I've already got this in the wrong spot. Forgive me. Bum, bum, bum. Come on. All right. Sorry, folks. Come on. There we go. Sean Kelly Project Lead. Um, Four years ago, um, Lauren Zalat, our director of education, suggested that we begin hiring people who've been incarcerated onto our education team. And uh, she and I began looking for colleagues who were doing similar work. And we flew to Chicago uh, to meet with people at the Hull House. They were doing some work that was um, related. And as part of that process, we also wanted to stop off and see um, some artists working on a project called 96 Acres. 96 Acres is an artist collective run by Maria Gaspar uh, since 2012. Um, 96 Acres is a reference to the Cook County Jail, which is the largest correctional institution in the United States by square footage. And they've built an entire practice around drawing attention to that footprint of that building in Chicago and its implication for the city. Um, and while we were out there by total coincidence, I believe Maria told me herself actually, that they were projecting films onto the wall of the Cook County Jail. And so Lauren and I went out and saw some films projected onto the wall of Cook County. And one of the films, there were several films being, being projected. One of them, this is gonna sound very familiar, one of them was a film put together by artist Damon uh, Locks. And he worked with people who were incarcerated in Illinois prisons to make animation. The film is called Freedom Time. Um, that's actually a photograph on screen right now of the night that Lauren and I were there. I'm going to play you a little section, if I can get the section I want here, Freedom Time. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I could fast forward this. Can't. Damon wrote the soundtrack himself, but the films were all made by people who are incarcerated or were at the time they made them.
So, <laughs> this is on our website. This is on the about page of our website. I want to read the statement because we uh, worked with uh, Maria Gaspar, we worked with uh, Damon Locke, Sarah Ross, uh, some of the artists uh, on this project, and uh, we got their blessing to work on this project. In fact, at one point, Damon said, the more people going into prisons and listening to those voices and bringing them out and trying to amplify those voices, the better. But um, we worked with the artists to make sure that we were crediting everyone and acknowledging their work in a way that felt uh, responsible to all the parties involved. I'm gonna just read it. 96, sorry, Hidden Lives was inspired by and modeled from the 96 Acres project led by artist Maria Gaspar at Cook County Jail since 2012, specifically the animation Freedom Time, a project orchestrated by artist Damon Locks and developed with the Jane Addams Hull House and Prison Plus Neighborhood Arts Project and presented as part of Stories from the Inside slash Outside on September 15th, 2015. So um, this is all on our website. Uh, you can find the links there. So after getting the blessing of the artists involved in Chicago and thinking about how a project might look here, our next stop was our friends at the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, which have paid for, our, um, paid for the Prisons Today exhibit that many of you may know. And we worked with them to think through what a project, if there, there, was, if there was a funding model that made sense for Eastern State Penitentiary. We put together an advisory panel, uh, Louis Messiah from Scribe Video, um, and Jesse Crimes, um, who's a well-known formerly incarcerated artist here in Philadelphia, are our core advisors. Uh, and we went to Pew and eventually did get funding for this project. Um, so we tried to imagine what this would look like in Philadelphia. And as we thought it through, some of the pro challenges that were distinct to Eastern State or distinct to Philadelphia were that we wanted both the voices of men and women who are incarcerated in our project the women's prison, the main women's prison in Pennsylvania is called Muncie, and it is about a three, three and a half hour drive, making it effectively impossible to work at Muncie uh, with Philadelphia, the Philadelphia-based crew. And we spent a long time actually wondering if we could hire a whole second team up in central Pennsylvania to run a project out of Muncie and decided that this wasn't realistic. Um, and so we decided instead to work with uh, the city prisons to work with women and the state prisons to work with men. So Sean Hawes, who I was hoping would be here, but I don't think she is. Sean Hawes from the city prisons has been a godsend. We worked with her to think through how this could work in the city prisons for women. And I won't say much more about the state prisons because Mandy Quinn is here. Uh, but we worked with the state prisons uh, to work in Chester, which is a medium security men's facility just outside of Philadelphia. Um, the challenges of working in a county prison or a city prison compared to a state prison are enormous. And William, I know, is going to spend some time talking about that. But essentially, we had to create two separate protocols, two separate whole curricula for two protocols for designing these films for these two different groups of people because the conditions of their incarceration are so dramatically different from one another. Um, so at this point, um, Lauren and I went back to uh, Chester, this is almost exactly a year ago, believe it or not, and Mandy invited us to come up and we went and spoke. There was a play that was being produced at Chester and at the end of the play, which also, by the way, an excellent play by um, a gentleman who was one of our filmmakers in the class. And so Lauren and I watched this film, which was amazing, or sorry, the, this play, and at the end of the play we got up and said, if you would like to learn about animation, if you'd like to learn about screenwriting, we're hosting a one-year process uh, where you can learn about those things and at the end um, you'll uh, produce a film that we will project on the outside wall of Eastern State. I'm actually not sure how Mandy chose the students for the class, but she's going to tell us in a minute. I've actually always meant to ask you more specifically, but that's something you want to talk about tonight. But uh, the Department of Corrections and the city prisons both found us cohorts of people who were interested in, in making films, and we began having classes. Um, we then, well, yeah, at this point we hired um, Robin Boosman, who's here with us today. Robin used to work for Mural Arts. I think folks here might know her uh, for her work at Mural Arts, but we really needed a project manager and someone who'd done this kind of work inside of prisons, which we'd done small bits and pieces, but this is on a scale unlike anything we'd ever done. So we hired Robin, and with Robin's help, we hired our two teaching artists. One is William Wallace, who's here tonight. Um, the other um, is uh, Erica Suchia Barrer. And Erica is in Japan, but I think she's watching on Facebook. Uh, but she's um, Erica and William. Here's Erica. Uh, Erica and William put together a uh, curriculum 
and began teaching classes. This is Erica talking, uh, working, she's doing a zoetrope um, animation cylinder, one of the first days of class with one of our students, one of our filmmakers named Justino, who's a terrific, wonderful leader within the class um, and someone I've spent a lot of time talking to about his life and dreams and his son is actually gonna be performing later at part of our programming. Uh, but anyway, I just wanna get a photograph of Erica. Here's another photograph of Erica. Um, and uh, here she's talking to Clarence, one of our other filmmakers in the class. And here's what the class looks like. I think people often just kind of curious what it looks like. Not particularly unlike a high school class, except there are bars in the window. Uh, people aren't allowed to leave. Um, but that's the actual room where we met. Uh, Erica and William, uh, with support from Robin and me, and from Lauren and Annie Anderson, who's here somewhere too, um, also hired some help. And so some significant people who came and helped the class. This is um, uh, Lowell Boston, who's teaching that class about the concepts of animation in one of the early days. Um, but I also want to give a particular shout out to Christina May, who's here with us today. Uh, Christina, uh, Christina joined our team. This, if you look at the, uh, the, the project team section of the website, it's a cast of thousands by now. But Christina joined us, I think William brought her onto the project actually, but uh, <laughs> feels weird to talk about you in third person when sitting right here. Christina joined the project really as a script coach and was extremely good helping us think through scripts and then became a voice coach. This is Joe recording his his voiceover and we're going to play for you some of the films tonight i would encourage you to listen to the audio quality we've not cleaned up the audio more than was necessary you'll really hear the echo uh, of where they were recorded this is um aaron eigler from greenhouse media he and matt sueb are the the team that is greenhouse media and there are animation specialists and they're also going to be our projection specialists when we get to showing these films anyway this is aaron recording joe's soundtrack and there's christina coaching him along to make sure we get the best possible read. Christina joined us as a, originally as a script coach, but she became a voice coach. Honestly, I feel like she became kind of a life coach, uh, not just to the uh, filmmakers in the class, but to some of us running the project. We had a tough winter. Uh, we hit some, some real hurdles over the winter and um, Christina was a constant source of uh, level-headedness throughout. So it was really terrific. Um, and so uh, yeah, Greenhouse, we hired Greenhouse. Um, I was going to say a few more words about some other of the folks. We just wanted to make sure the whole point of this project is to bring out the humanity of people behind the walls. In fact, the quote that will probably be on the wall at the start of every screening this fall, and that was the first thing that our, uh, the funder read in our grant proposal, is a quote you hear a lot inside of prisons. People say, the walls don't just keep the public, sorry, the walls don't just keep the prisoners in, they keep the public out. People who live in prisons feel very isolated from the rest of the world. Well, because they are. Uh, because you, people don't typically know what happens behind those walls aside from what they see on television and movies, which is, has almost no bearing to what actually happens inside prisons. And so um, we're trying to use our wall as a window into to prisons. Um, so anyway, in that light, we want to just talk about a couple of the students along the way. The student on our right is Danye. Um, on the first day of class, we had an exercise where we all went in a circle and said, what does animation mean to you? What kind of associations do you have with animation? And Danye said that to him, animation reminded him of the films he was forced to watch when he was in foster care, because all the rules of foster care were explained in animated films, and he had to watch the same film again and again every time he changed foster homes. Um, and I also wanted to say that Danye was one of our filmmakers who really wanted to tell stories that probably didn't make sense for a piece of public art. The final expression of these films is on a public street where people might be pushing their strollers by or whatnot. Danya was really wanted to talk about the history of racial oppression in this country. And it's a topic that we here at Eastern State Penitentiary take very, very seriously. Um, and so just to name that, it was not something that made sense either for the Department of Corrections or even for us to put on a public street. Um, there are aspects of those parts of those stories do come through, but it, it, in the explicit way that Donnie wanted was not something that made sense. He's a wonderful, terrific human being and a, been a great addition to the class. Um, I already mentioned Justino, he's on our left, and Jerome. They're working on um, light tables. When I was in school, light tables were these enormous things. These days, light tables are about a quarter of an inch thick, uh, but they're, they're working on animation. Of course, you trace the previous um, screen. And um, Jerome, on our right, and I've had some wonderful conversations about his business acumen. Jerome buys and sells a lot of real estate. His family does, but he puts a lot of work into that from the inside. Um, very intellectual and interesting person. 
One last team, the one last part of our team that I, I wanted to make sure to mention is um, Ming Media. From the beginning, we said that the funder actually asked us, how will you document this? We thought rather than a catalog, we wanted to make a documentary about the making of the films, which is kind of meta, but in, in the end, I think it's gonna make a lot of sense. And we said, the team that we want filming this is called Ming Media, it's a Museum in Neighborhood Group. Um, it was founded by L. Sawyer and John, um, John Kaufman, thank you. I'm embarrassed, I forgot his name. Uh, we spent a lot of time with John and, and L. L had the idea for this company while he was incarcerated. He learned some of his, the beginning of his skills uh, filmmaking while he was incarcerated and they, they bring with them a sensitivity to the possibility of, of the ways that people in this class could feel exploited. Um, and so John and L and their team um, have been filming, not a lot because it's hard to get a camera into a prison, but they've been filming here and there with wonderful support from the DOC. Uh, a couple of the classes have been filmed and I've, to finish off my section, I want to show you a little section of John and Elle's film, give you a sense of what the class feels like. Here's Go. Lewis. Clarence. Justino. It's Justino again. We're loading the paper into a zoetrope cylinder, so when it spins, it runs. We look through the little slots. There's roll. It's like the fifth day of class or something. So look through the little slots. They would made their own little sequence. As we look through the slots, you see it repeated. Let's go. So um, the final expression, this will be a film about the making of the films and the film will embed all of our students' films will be shown in full as part of the documentary within Spread Throughout. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Mandy Quinn of the department, Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, Mandy. Hello everyone, uh, thank you, Sean. So I'm not good with public speaking, so forgive me if there's a lot of ums or whatever. So I'm gonna just kind of go with it since I didn't really practice anything. But um, I will say from the beginning of this, from the time Sean came and pitched it to when we selected the inmates to the first day of class was probably less than two months. Over the course of a month, we came up with a list of eligibility um, and over a hundred, men applied to participate in the class, which we thought was really overwhelming. We thought maybe 20 or 30, we would be able to manage and not cut anybody out. The way that they're selected to answer your question is um, bribery. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the way they're selected is anytime uh, inmates face or image or sound or voice is used in any type of media, they have to be approved by the department or the Office of Victim Advocate. Um, we sent up a list of everybody. We made sure that they were going to be here for the entire year. We didn't want anybody that was paroling in the middle because it really would cut off that whole last semester and it would really be a waste of time for everybody. And they came back. We sent up 110 names and they came back with 20. Of the 20, 19 completed the entire class and are still going strong. Of those 19, two will be paroled. Uh, come the premiere date of, of this film. So that'll be really interesting. Um, so so they'll, be able to, they'll be able to see the entire thing on, on the wall. Um, so that being said, I think when the students first started the class, it was a lot of talk with Erica and William about what's the best way to deliver the class. 20 students break it up into two groups one large group and I think we finagled with it for a little while until we found the best option was that large group picture that um, that you saw earlier in the large classroom. We did, was it an hour and a half at a time in the beginning and then we just kind of made it four hours a week uh, so they can get the best, the best and the most impactful, get everything done since, it, since they were only coming once a week. Um, these are some of the, these are some of the students you have 
Donye, Paul, and Marvin. I, I'm going to just say their first name since we're not allowed to say their last names at this point. Um, I typically sat in the corner of the class, so Erica and William were able to do their thing. If they needed me, I was always there for assistance. These guys, are, you know, they made phenomenal films. Um, part of the process was approving the scripts, like Sean said. I think everybody wanted to tell a story. They wanted to tell a story that was going to be impactful to the community. They wanted to tell their story, their version of their story. Unfortunately, we had to censor some of the scripts, not because we didn't appreciate what they had to say, but because we wanted to make sure that what they had to say wasn't going to be offensive. It wasn't going to diminish the crime, wasn't going to not think about the victim first which is why they had to be approved anyway uh, to participate in the film or in the entire project whatsoever. So it was a lot of back and forth. It was a lot of rewriting. It was a lot of using, you know, passionate expressions and, and not having a lot of agreement. But at the end of the day, I think everybody was able to be satisfied with the scripts that were kind of put out there. We had a counterpart previously um, at our central office and she wanted it to be grammatically correct. I don't think some of these men speak in grammatically correct terms, so they wanted to speak in their own language that made, come to, made sense to them. So that was something that um, I didn't really push for. I thought that they should be able to speak how they wanted, but with respect to, to the victims. But I think we have 19 scripts and seeing them for the first time last week and how they tied everything together really you know, after doing this for almost a year, really reignited my passion for this entire project. It, it did hit a few bumps in the road. Um, I think come the end of December, the guys were a little burned out. They don't just sit around while they're in prison. Um, they're very busy. They have classes, they have jobs, they have activities that they do on a pretty regular basis. Um, and as dumb as it sounds, carving out four hours a week to sit in a class was fine, but I think they were a little lackadaisical on their homework. Is that right, William? They got a little lackadaisical on their homework um, to where we ended up being behind schedule because they weren't doing their part. So I want to say that, you know, it, it's hard. They weren't allowed to have the light tables in their cell. You know, that's something that wasn't allowed for them. So they had to really get a little bit creative. So what we ended up doing was offering what we called arts and crafts. Arts and Crafts was an afternoon program ran by me, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, every day from February, still going on if, if, if they end up assigning us homework just to make sure they have everything they need. And I think by April, we were all caught up in where we needed to be. It was a little, it was a little um, touch and go there for a while, keeping them motivated, keeping them interested, having them redraw the same thing. And I think William will talk about the, the whole process, but having to draw the same picture 50 times on a paper gets a little redundant. I don't think they realized what they were signing up for, but I think after, like I said, seeing the one of the kind of rough cuts, it really was like, oh, that's what I did. So they, they enjoyed it. Um, this is some of them using the light table. That was another project. It was an iPad that was brought in to kind of capture. And William will talk more about the different ways that they were able to do this entire project. Um, this is our entire group, all, all of us, including the teachers and Sean. The only one missing in that picture is Robin because I think she was on another one of her fantasy trips. So I think it was Portugal that time. In the picture, you see I'm holding a little white dog. Her name is Elsa. She is one of the typically 20 dogs that we have at SCI Chester. We run, and I'll say it on Facebook Live, the largest dog program in the state of Pennsylvania. Every prison pretty much in Pennsylvania has a dog program. Ours is 100% funded by WAGS Rescue and Referral. Elsa is our class mascot. It was Elsa or any of the other dozen dogs that typically would come up and kind of sit in the class. Um, multiple inmates and I'm just going to look and see here's a better here's a better picture of Elsa she's a purebred Pekingese that was thrown out of a window because she has a knee issue so um, these guys love the dogs um, she I just forgot what I was going to say 
So one of, we have a lot of guys in our program that are actually participating in our dog program. And you'll see, you'll see the video. Um, we also have cats. We have cats in the prison as well. And that's more to dog test the cats and kind of it's a whole system. Um, Elsa currently has pink ears now. But one of our gentlemen in the program, one of his stories is actually about the dog program in general and how it really gave him a new purpose in life. And I will play that clip now. This is Joe's film. Press down, right? When I was presented with the opportunity to be a dog handler trainer, I jumped at it. I love dogs and always have one at home. We get these dogs from WAG's rescue. They come from high kill shelters, owner surrenders, and have been picked up as strays. Some abused, some not. I've had in two years, 24 dogs, and everyone has been adopted. Some really great dogs. It can bring tears to your eyes when they leave. But the purpose of this program is to find these dogs forever homes. Because when one leaves, sadly, there's another to take their place. The amount of love these dogs receive, you wouldn't believe and they soak it up. I feel this is one of the best programs to ever come into the Department of Corrections. It gives me a sense of purpose. I have to say, all I saw him doing in the corner was coloring that little red warehouse thing. It was supposed to be like the evil building. That's all I ever saw him work on. I never saw him work on anything else because I sat in my corner, right? So when I saw this last week, I was just almost taken back because I forget that he's been in our program. He was one of the, he's one of the original, one of the original men in our program. And since the time that he submitted his drawings, he's had three dogs since then. So his number is that 27 dogs. And currently he has a 180 pound Mastiff. So if anybody's in the market for a 180 pound Mastiff, we have them at Chester for you. So um, that's all I have to say about the DOC side. I want to introduce William. He's been a pivotal part of this. It's been challenging, but I think we couldn't have found a better instructor for us. So without further ado, William. Let's see. So let's raise that up a little bit. All right, uh, let's see. Hey, yeah, that's my name. Uh, I'm William. I was one of the teachers who was in there every week. It was me and Erica, who I half wish could be here, but I'm also really happy that she's on vacation. It's well-deserved, uh, put in an insane amount of work. Um, so I'm gonna start off by talking about the RCF, uh, our women's class. I'm gonna skip over here. So this is one of, uh, one of our students who's working on the copy stand, which was a tool that we brought in. It, it, it involves the iPad and we use it to do stop motion animation. Um, one of the challenges around working and doing art in prison is what you can and cannot bring into prison to, like on at any given point. Like uh, scissors, definite no-no. So that was another thing we had to figure out. Like how are we, go how are we going to do this? So we, well, we have the tools to do stop motion. How do we cut paper? Uh, so we had to get a little bit creative with that. But um, working at RCF at a county jail you never really knew what was going to happen from week to week. Like um, at Chester, we had a set class, we had set people, we knew they were going to be there, we knew the length of their term. But at county, you would think, all right, I have this many people, we've been working together for so long, and then you show up and they're like, where's half my class? Like, uh, these three got released, these three are in the hole, and these two are, um, went, up, went upstate to other prison. So we had to work in a more collaborative sense than the individual scripts that we were able to produce over two semesters at um, Chester. Um, so let's see. What so just a little closer. That's actually my sweater that we're using as a background. Um, this student was one of the most creative people I've ever met. Every week she was working on something new. Uh, we decided to bring in fabric, uh, fabric samples and cut up mag or magazines to cut up and she was always inventing characters and stories and trying to tell some things related to her truth and other things that just might be interesting especially towards her children like how do I tell my story in a way that's approachable to people across all ages and is still fun um yeah unfortunately she was a, she was actually one of those surprises so she came in at the be at the end of our first semester and really started our core group going into second semester when we were able to pick up steam. And three quarters of the way through second semester, she 
we thought she was getting released, but ended up actually going upstate, and we had no idea walking into class. So hope she's doing well. Um, but moving forward, so we also got to play with a lot of kind of unusual materials. We uh, ended up making monsters out of claymation one day just to kind of get the ball rolling creatively. It's like, what, what can we do? How do we, how, do we, how do we inspire people who have not historically been artists to be able to create something? And we like to, keep, to kind of play around with more low-key, less uh, traditional art forms. Um, so once again, this is our RCF class. Uh, we were in the gym. So we had a couple tables set up, covered in supplies. We had to sprout to the floor so we could have people working together, cutting things up, gluing things together together, doing their drawing, working on a light table, whatever had to happen. Uh, just one more shot of them. Um, so a little bit more on the process of developing these classes. So, so starting off in semester one, uh, Eric and I really wanted to get kind of a crash course in foundational art making. So we did some of the more classical things. We did still lives, we did portraits of each other. And if you imagine having 20 people who haven't taken maybe a drawing class ever, certainly not in a long time, and you say, draw the person across from you. Uh, Quinn participated. Yeah, and like at first people were like, I don't, I don't, well, I don't trust you to draw me. Also, I don't trust me to draw you. And like once we actually revealed those images, some of them were amazing, some of them were god awful, but it really kind of leveled the playing field just to be like, okay, so I can make something. And I feel like that was a big part of the class itself, the idea that I can make something, I am a human, I do have a voice and it is valid. So we're gonna move on a little forward. Uh, once again, we have uh, Justino and Jerome, uh, kind of the two of the old men in the class who are always razzing everybody. Learned a lot from both of those guys. Um, and I can't wait to see their pieces when they're done. Once again, um, Justino. I don't want to give away any spoilers on his piece because right now we see him coloring, but it wasn't just coloring. He also did a, this kind of tracing project known as rotoscoping. So it's kind of, it's like live action that's been cut apart and glued back together, flipped over, changed the colors and made a whole new kind of art out of it. Uh, moving forward, we have Ezra, another one of the, our older students. Always had something to say, always had a bit of wisdom to impart. It was kind of hard to get to shut up at times, but we really love Ezra. One more of him. And moving forward, this is, um, this is David. David was one of the few students who really had kind of, I don't know if it was a classical art background or just years and years and years of working on it while he's been incarcerated. So he was always working to help uh, other students while they designed their animations. And he was one of the few people who really dug into the idea of old school cell animation. So if you think of cell animation, that's like what the original cartoons were. It's like one, one page, one cell equals one frame. And while these things are running generally, I think current animation runs around like 60 frames per second. So to get one second of animation now, it would take 60 individual frames. We're running at closer to 12 frames per second but that's still 12 individual drawings for one second of animation. So now we're actually going to watch uh, David's film. So keep that in mind. One second, 12 frames. Decades ago, I threw my life away and education was wasted. The only things gained were fortitude and patience. I wake up every day to be counted. However, my routine is to avoid people and to be as unnoticed as possible. The rest of my day is like I sleepwalk. No matter how much I try, the front doors to freedom are out of reach. So much time is spent obsessing about a single mistake, which equates to 20 years. 20 years in a law library studying how freedom was lost by myself and others like me. Yeah. Yeah, powerful stuff. Um, so this is another one of our students from our men's class. This is Brian, who was one of the most quiet people I've ever met. He 
you never really knew what Brian was working on, just that he was working on something. Um, and I was talking to Sean earlier today about an, another, excuse me, another small Brian story when they were coming in to discuss some logistics toward the end of the, pro of the, of the project. And Brian kind of interrupted Sean's introduction to it. It was just like, okay, yeah, just get to the point. What, what do you want to do? I don't have time to small talk. I have work to do. Um, which makes him sound like a bit harder than he is. He's actually just, uh, he's a really sweet guy. Um, and once this film came together, that really have shows this sweeter, softer side that you don't expect to see when you think about people in prison. So we're gonna move right on to Brian's film. Dear Tom, how have you been? But as I sit and write this letter, I reflect back on your words. Time heals all wounds. But did it heal the hurt and pain that I've caused by my ignorance? How can it heal the heart of two daughters? How can it heal the heart of a father? How can I get missed moments, first steps, first days of school, dance recitals, art displays? Man, I wish I could buy you back. But I thank you because all that I have lost has given me much gratitude and much appreciation. And I value how important you are to me. You showed me how to enjoy every precious moment. I didn't understand, or should I say, know my value until I actually lost you. During my moment of loss, you gave me much guidance and showed me how much potential I had. I am forever grateful to you. Thank you, Don. All right. So uh, a couple last words from me. Over the course of the, the last nine months, 10 months, September through April, uh, while I was teaching these courses, um, something struck me, which was that over the course of a week, the most kind, insightful, and knowledgeable people who I talk to are actually incarcerated, which is not something that you expect. I learned so much from my students. Like, I, that's invaluable. But... I'm so excited to see their films on the wall. I'm so excited to see everybody's reactions, but mostly I'm excited to have been able to give, um, to participate in this opportunity for somebody to feel like a person again behind the wall. And I actually do have one last story going back to RCF. So we had, um, a, I think they were our youngest student. They were a self-proclaimed loudmouth, always wanting, always kind of just running around trying to build something, trying to do something, blah, blah, blah and they were obsessed with glitter. Glitter was their thing. And from first semester, they were always like, okay, so colored pencils, markers, that's cool or whatever, but can we get some glitter though? Um, and towards the end of the class, when we were really all the way into our um, stop motion process, we were able to bring in, I don't know, 20 different colors of glitter, just a pile, a mountain of glitter. And this kid absolutely lost their mind. And then, like, from their excitement, the rest of the class also got really excited. Like, the staff was excited, the teachers were excited, all the students were excited. And just seeing how something so small, just a piece of glitter, can change somebody's entire day, their whole perspective, and bring a little bit of joy, I think was probably the most powerful part of this for me. So, I'm going to hand this back over to Sean, a little bit of closing announcements. Thank you. you want to see the films, uh, August 15th through September 12th, uh, we have some postcards outside. We're showing the films uh, by theme, and so there are four weekly themes. Every week we're going to show some of our students' films, some of the films out of this class, uh, with some guest films uh, in groups by week. And then on September 12th, I'm going to show nothing but films from this group of extraordinary filmmakers back to back all night long. So please come back. Uh, Lauren Zell and Damon McCool are, and Robin Boosman are putting together uh, some programming for uh, the coffee shop across the street. I should acknowledge OCF Coffee House is donating the space, uh, which is going to become our event hub uh, for the month while we project these films. But if you happen to miss them, you can also see the films on our website. All 20 films will live on on our website as well as on that documentary. Um, Lauren and Damon and Robin are hiring people to work in the coffee shop. We're calling them ambassadors. Uh, Lauren's here. 
So uh, talk to us afterwards if you know someone who might want to work the event. Just leave that up there while we take questions. This is our class shot again. Um, this photograph makes me happy. Um, and that's it. Do you have any questions for us? Mimi. Can you talk a little bit about? Can you talk a little bit about the criteria for selecting the people? A hundred wanted to get in, but you only picked twenty. So, what was the criteria for selection? So, I can't really talk about what the criteria is and what the process is for the Office of Victim Advocate to approve or disapprove someone. I don't even know. I can't tell you that. But I can tell you that Chester's criteria to even acknowledge or even put send someone up to even be considered. They would have to be here the entire time. You know, if, if they had a parole mandate for May, then we would have considered them, They, you know, because the project would have been over at that time. Um, no misconduct history or no violent assaults um, for a certain time period. No history of drugs or any, any misconducts during that time. A misconduct is when you break the rule. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Good housing and, and unit reports. Um, had to have completed their programming. We didn't want this class to interfere with anything that they were required to do in order to make parole. Um, they had to have a job. You know, they had to have something to do during the day. They couldn't be in what we consider restrictive housing. That's, you know, impossible to even accommodate them. Thankfully, no, none of our students in this class um, are in that type of lifestyle while they're incarcerated where they are in and out of the RHU. So they're, you know, we have a pretty good group to where they're, you know, this is a gift and they know that, so. Let's clarify one thing. Uh, Mandy mentioned earlier that 19 out of the 20 students who started the class at Chester finished. Um, the one student who didn't finish, didn't finish because he went home. Um, so we assumed Robin and I and Lauren and some of the team in the early stages is, we're predicting a 25% drop off in attrition rate. And every student who, who started the class finished with the film. So uh, that's a real testament, I think, to William and to Erica and the team that was, and to Christina and the team that was really coaching because it's a tedious, tedious process. Um, it's hard, you have to really have faith that it's gonna come out looking like it looks because the, the week in the week out is pretty tedious. Um, but they got a lot of support. Oh, I was just wondering if there's going to be like an official um, screening of the final films uh, for the artists to, to watch and get together. Yeah. So, yes, uh, where it's in the beginning stages at this point, the, the gentlemen have a lot of thoughts um, about how they want it. I think there was something about a red carpet, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> um, we would like to, you know, go big or go home. That's kind of how Chester is. If, you know, if you've never been there, we've done TEDx's and a slew of other things where, you know, this is really important to them to, to put out there. This has been a year's worth of work by the time it premieres. And I, I think it's important. We would like to invite some of their families to come in and watch it with them. We just recently had a family day where families were able to come in and kind of have lunch and you know, with, with the guys that they paid for. So we would like to do something a little similar, maybe like a premiere party. So we're kind of waiting until kind of the actual premiere of this before we start working on it inside Chester. So we would have a better time frame when the documentary is done. We're looking at maybe November, so it's kind of hitting right around the holidays, so. And I would just add that the, um, the what the, what the, of course, the, the filmmakers are seeing their films in draft um, as we go. So they will see the, the finished version of their film before it goes live on the wall. We need some of the choices really have to be done outside of the prison because it requires computers. And so they're explaining to us if they want sound effects, if they want music. What you saw was not the finished pieces, not even credits and what you saw. Some, a lot of those um, creative choices they're gonna to explain to us and we're gonna take our best shot um, and then come back and show it to them and see if they if they if it's what they are imagining. Anyway, they will see the final film before it goes up. But we're going to go back and show them eventually in a format yet to be decided. Is the is the documentary which will embed their films in the documentary. So if you watch the documentary, you'll see all 20 films. The 20th film is the single film out of Riverside. Uh, the women collaborated on the film, 
And so there are a total of 20 films. Um, so all 20 films will be embedded into the documentary. We're gonna take that back into Chester. We're gonna show them what they will see is the way their film looked when it was on the wall, but they will also see um, the audience reaction to it because we're gonna film the audience responding. And then the folks at Ming being the mad geniuses that they are said, we should film the filmmakers watching audience reaction to their films. <laughs> So it's like, it's like the snake eats its tail, but it's the final documentary will filmmakers watching audience reaction to their own films. So that's that. Uh, my question is, um, do you have any observations, any of you about the therapeutic value of this, how this has impacted the inner lives and the, uh, the functioning of these uh, folks who were able to participate? Um, let's see, uh, long term, I'm not 100%, but while class was happening, having a space where you could interact, or I guess we could interact, the students could interact, and be genuinely viewed as any other human on par with everybody else in the room had profound therapeutic uh, effects. Um, the re some of the relationships that were built between students in the class, I believe, will be moving forward. and. The confidence to have uh, the confidence in building these new skills and finding creative ways of thinking and also creative releases, I think, will also carry profound weight throughout their lives. We can I? I can. I think okay. part of her privacy. So it's kind of a personal story, but you, you told me that you've seen a change in one of our filmmakers. Entire way we have a gentleman who tend to kept, keep to himself, was a little bit of a loner. Um, you would only know about him if you read about him on paper. Um, not because he would do anything wrong, he would just write a lot. And participating in the class allowed him to formulate those relationships, like William said, kind of open himself up a little bit more. Um, and, you know, now he's participating. He has a job, you know, where he has to socialize with people. He gets off the block a lot. You see him in the yard a lot. He has a lot less complaints. Um, you know, he's proud of the work that he's done and, and the, the class that he was able to participate in. So I think that is just one example of how you know, just a little bit of art therapy, arts and crafts, as I like to call it, um, really allowed him to open up over the course of, you know, nine, 10 months, allowed him to feel comfortable, as comfortable as you can get while you're incarcerated, better than he's had in the past 20 years since he's been in there, so. I just wanna echo what William said, that who knows long-term, I don't, we're not claiming that that we're changing the world here. We don't, don't want to make the claim that this is going to solve mass incarceration in the United States. I'm confident that the people who are in this class, or these filmmakers, had a really positive creative outlet to express their lives. And we're going to project it with a 30,000 lumen projector every night for a month on a public street. And so we feel pretty good about this group of people for this chunk of time. but. Mass incarceration is real. That's a, it's a big, there's a lot of 2.2 million people incarcerated. I mean, even for this one group, who knows? Hi, you've answered um, the first part of my question. What did the 19 do um, after the program was over? Um, the second part of the question is, how about the next 19? I mean, so, so all of the equipment that we've used has been donated to Chester. So while we don't plan on doing this entire project again with the documentary and so forth, um, I think a lot of the students in the class have the skill set to be able to, you know, teach other students and maybe make it kind of an optional arts and crafts class since it's kind of been ongoing already for 10 months. So that's something that we're kind of considering at this point and have it played, you know, kind of on our inmate TV channel just as more of a fun little clip and reel. So that's definitely in the baby stages. But I mean, it's definitely worth a shot, so. 
That's a really hard question. And I can see our director of education, Lauren, smiling next to you. It's a question that we ask a lot. There's both the question of what the next 19, what I keep thinking about is the current 19. Uh, we had a ceremony last week where we gave everyone a, just to acknowledge they'd finished two semesters of, of hard work, we gave everyone a certificate so they can illustrate that down the road. And uh, we met up at Chester and um, it was very emotional. And one of our filmmakers, Jerome, I had a specific conversation with him and I said, I'm not gonna forget, like I consider him a friend. And I told him that, like, I, like this is not like the last day of this class, you know, you're ever gonna see us again. That's just these current 19 folks, and it's only 19. Um, this has been a resource intense project funded by a very generous funder in the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, but we don't, I don't wish I had a better answer for you for the next 19. Um, Lauren, do you have anything to add to that? Can you get me off the hook here? Oh, yeah, or maybe. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I said to Sean when we were driving after the meeting with the folks to help plan the meet and greet, like, how do we maintain a relationship? So I think that's always a question when museums drop into these spaces and they do a project. How do you do that in a genuine way where you build relationships and you kind of keep that momentum going? So I think it's a question that we're asking ourselves. So it's a really great question. And I appreciate you bringing it into the space. I think um, we broke up into groups when we were at the Eastern State Penitentiary, I mean, Chester Prison, shout out to. And one thing about Chester that the, um, the group I was in from the inside out, they were saying how Chester is a special prison because it is about programming. And there's an idea of artist and ownership that is a gift that they have received. So they feel a sense of pride, the fact that they can create something that's their own. A lot of artists nowadays partner with people, they don't even get to own their work. Someone else owns their work. So the idea of they have a credit that is on the wall of Fairmount. They're able to say, this is what I owned. This is what I completed. It gives them a sense of self. Also, they told me to tell you all that come see the film, bring your family and see the humanity in it. Like remove all barriers, all issues, all things about who they are and really see them for who they are and um, support their work. Because a lot of these people are creators. This is just one brush stroke into what they're capable of doing. And so these men are, will be paroled soon, and they're gonna need places to come to. They're gonna need support. They're gonna need advocacy. They're gonna need love. So this is just the beginning, um, beginning mosaic in a bigger conversation. So come, come September 15th, August 15th to September 15th. Bring your family, bring your friends, bring the media so that these 19 men can be celebrated for the hard work that they're done. And Chester Prison can continue to do programs like this. So that's all I have to say about that. Starfire out. Why don't we take one more question and we'll call it a night. Yes. I'm, I'm interested, and I've been doing this at Riverside on a volunteer basis, teaching dance therapy to females. And for years, I've sent proposals and never got a good response back. I even called Chester to see if they would be open to me coming in and teaching dance therapy to the males. And maybe I didn't speak to the right person. I'm not sure. But that's something that I'm interested in doing. Um, there's a lot of benefits to getting men to open up to dance because they see it as being something for women mainly, but it's really a sport. And I did receive a Leeway Foundation grant to teach an all-male line dance class, which opened more men up to be more receptive to being a part of our line dancing um, group, which we're a part of now, which you know we do all over the United States. So I wanted to know who is it that I could make contact with to see if they would be open to do that, for me to do that. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my information at the end of this and then you can email me. That will be fine. We certainly believe in the power of art. Um, that's, this whole project is based on that. Thank you all for being here.
Um, really appreciate it. Please join us for an informal reception uh, afterwards. I'm sure William and Mandy uh, would join me in, in finishing the conversation outside over a bottle of cold water or a bottle of beer. Thank you so much, everybody.